Jack Florence, and I'm a sixth grader at Texel Middle School. On behalf of SATX Indivisible, March for Our Life San Antonio, and Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, San Antonio, welcome to the to Town Hall for Our Lives. Mass shootings at schools, churches, concerts, and movie theaters get a lot of attention, but gun violence is more than that. There are, there are shootings almost every day in San Antonio. Families living in black and brown communities have been fighting the battle against gun violence for years and years and years. Kids like me and the other kids here are done with all this. Our generation has the power to change how America thinks about guns. Yep, we have the power. And politicians had better listen to us if they want to keep their jobs. Yes. Lots of kids will be voting for the first time this year and next year and every year after that. Thank you for being here today. Please stand for a national anthem performed by Aubrey Hinchman. Myself. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Sofia Mendez and I'm part of March for Our Lives and I'm here to represent San Antonio today and all our students. Thank y'all so much for coming. Uh, it's really awesome to see that so many people have joined our movement in just, well, really a month, right? So um, today I'm specifically going to acknowledge the people here, our representatives, which are the people that we're trying to get here to for the Town Hall for Our Lives Day. Um, Daniela Salinas and um, Juliet uh, are representing here, Diego Bernal, and we just want to thank you, as well as Erna Gutierrez, Annalise Escobar, Brendan Kennedy, Larry Romo, and Kel Claire Alford, which are representing Dara today. I'm sorry if I'm not very good with names uh, and chopping it all up, but I just I um, want to thank y'all today for coming here and representing these elected officials as well as our candidates here today um, because even though we were not able to get some of our elected officials to come, we decided to go for the candidate that was opposing them. So today, Brad Messler here is here, Carlos Antonio Raymond and Claire Barnett are here to represent San Antonio and come and listen to us. So thank you all for being here. Let's just give this round. just another number, percentage, and brick in the wall. You will not hear my name in respect for victims of gun violence that may have been stripped of their humanity in order to fit on a number scale and used as political firepower by many public figures. The victims' names, stories, and dreams rarely ever shared with the world. Not just the victims of mass shootings, but the thousands of minorities who are marginalized and killed by gun violence each day. These are the voices that are often never heard in this debate, and they all demand to be heard, and so do we. On an average day in America, seven children die from gun violence, and every year an average of 13,000 people fall victim to, can you guess, gun violence. People who had entire lives to lead, stories to hear, and events to witness, gone. I'm supposed to be talking about the normalization of gun violence and shootings in America, but tell me, how do you begin to summarize an entire lifetime of fear on a piece of paper or in a speech that's supposed to last three minutes? The short answer is, is that I would have to fit in all of the classroom debates, lockdown drills, and hours of sitting in front of different screens but hearing the same story time and time again. that we as a nation fail to take action. Thousands of screens playing countless news coverages of kids and adults limping out of buildings, parents pleading for change, and victims being labeled as crisis actors. 
The concerning thing is that these events are happening more and more. So much so that my peers have begun disassociating themselves from these events, all while becoming numb to the world around them. How can we as Americans label this country to be the best in the world when we can't even be honest with ourselves that we have a problem? There's a complete gap between those who write the narrative and those who live it, day by day. My generation is exhausted of constantly being told that this is just the way things are. Because no child should be afraid to attend school. Talking about shooting should not be a normal classroom debate, and drive-bys should not be a reoccurring event. We have grown up watching these massacres, one right after the other, back to back. Take the time to imagine what that's like for kids, then maybe you'll understand how big of a problem this is and why we're so eager for change. Join us in taking the first step towards becoming a better nation that guarantees safety for its citizens. Thank you. Uh, 
dealt with the National Rifle Association, I guess, uh, really since I was a young state senator. You can tell that was a while ago. Um, I want to introduce, in fact, my wife Libby, who's been putting up with me since we were students together. We've got two daughters now who have uh, two grand, we now have two grandchildren by each of them. And uh, we think about them and the danger that they could face because there's no reason that an incident like this couldn't happen right here or where they go to school. And that's the, the concern that I think affect many parents and grandparents along with the students uh, that uh, are out there knowing we can do something about this. But my initial dealings with the National Rifle Association were when I was a young state senator representing an area up in Austin. Uh, and I heard about something called cop killer bullets at that time, a few decades ago. Those were bullets that had been invented that would pierce a, a, a Kevlar vest that a law enforcement officer might uh, be wearing to protect themselves. And so I passed legislation through the Texas legislature that fortunately the NRA found out about only when it was pending for a vote over in the House. And we were able to overcome them and actually get it signed into law. It's almost inconceivable today that you could pass anything that the NRA opposed, but we got that passed. And uh, when I first ran for Congress, uh, we had the assault weapons ban in place, and the NRA was trying to put a stop to it. Even George W. Bush, when he ran for president, endorsed uh, an assault weapons ban. And I actually ran advertisements when I was first running for office uh, that singled out the NRA for its opposition uh, to the assault weapons ban uh, and to doing anything about this. In more recent times, uh, in 2016, to try to dramatize this after the Pulse nightclub uh, shootings, we actually had a unique protest on the floor of the House that some of you may remember in the United States Capitol, led in large, large measure by my uh, desk baked at the Ways and Means Committee, the great John Lewis, the civil rights leader, uh, where we had a kind of sit-in and an all-night all protest on the House floor just trying to bring some focus on this. Because gun safety, despite this violence that's gone on for many years, is essentially, was essentially dropped from the national agenda. The only time we considered a gun issue in Congress was when the NRA needed to find some obscure uh, regulation of law, like being able to carry a gun on, the, on a train, or how many guns you can take into a national park. It's just a way to mark some people as being, quote, anti-gun. I grew up in Texas. I grew up around guns. I remember the day my dad shot the first deer in the county and was presented with a 30-30. Uh, I'm not trying to take people's guns away from them. I'm trying to provide safety for their children and for anyone who's out at a public gathering and can be exposed to this. There's nothing inconsistent between the Second Amendment and the rights of legitimate gun owners and what the March for Our Lives agenda has been all about. Uh, and I think the focus has to be on comprehensive background checks so that uh, people are, who are criminals are not circumventing existing laws at a gun show or over the internet it needs to be over high capacity uh, ammunition and uh, uh, weapons. Military assault weapons are not needed for deer hunting or dove hunting. They won't leak much of the deer or the dove. Uh, the ability of our courts to go in, and if uh, there's someone who really poses a danger, uh, to be able to do something about it with, with an order. Uh, I would like to see action on these measures, uh, and I'm here really to respond to questions from our students and to engage in some discussion, not just to talk at you. Uh, but uh, I must say that the barriers that we face in this Congress are immense. And I, I think I'll just close by getting into one of the details that some of you may know about the way the House works, because frankly, it's the same problem that has prevented us acting uh, on our dreamers and on comprehensive immigration reform. It's the same barrier that once stood in the way of the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act 
and even blocked us for a long time in getting relief for Hurricane Sandy back at that time. And that is that in the House, there is an informal but strict rule that the Speaker will not permit debate or consideration on any bill that does not have the support of the majority of the majority. Uh, what that means in short is that about 20% of the members of the House can determine what gets on the floor. Uh, and because if they can keep a majority of the Republican caucus from, in, from endorsing the measure, the Speaker won't bring it up. So we have been asking uh, originally uh, and before uh, this latest shooting, uh, most, most uh, focused shooting in, in Florida, we were simply asking for a study commission about gun violence. And we couldn't get that bill on the floor because the majority of the majority of the Republican caucus wouldn't back it. And so any of the measures that are on our agenda that would do something about gun violence are blocked from our ever being able to vote or consider them. I suggested that instead of a moment of silence after these events, we have a moment of action where we have one day where anybody can kind of bring up any ideas they have uh, about this and let us have a vote and debate on it. But that is being blocked right now, and that's the big obstacle over in the House to our responding to some of your concerns. But perhaps this is a good time against that backdrop to hear from uh, some of our students. I don't know exactly what format uh, I do. Uh, Reverend Vegas, still here? Yes. Yes, I want to, do want to say thanks uh, to you for opening this church. Uh, we were not just Libby and I were with them uh, a while ago uh, across the way as they opened uh, some of their facilities so that our uh, parents who are students at UTSA have a place that's safe and secure for their kids to be here while they're going to school. So you, are you going to recognize students or what? Two students are going to kick off their questions. Okay. Yeah, and then we'll... And then we're going to do audience That's great. Thank you. Thank you uh, both for your speech and your public service over the years. Um, and with that in mind, we'll go into our first question, which is, uh, in addition to what you've already talked to us about, what are the other large obstacles to getting gun reform through our Senate, and then what are the best ways we can overcome those? Well, uh, it's a tough question because the obstacles are tough. You want to be able to suggest something that you can go out and do this weekend or tomorrow. Uh, that will really change things and give us a chance. But I have to tell you very candidly that there's some of these folks that are in elective office that you can beat on their door all month long and you'll just come out with a sore hand uh, because they're not going to change. They're so indebted to the NRA. Uh, I've never taken a dime from the NRA. that I think there's some things we can learn from the NRA. It is not just the power of their money, though they gave a substantial amount to elect Donald Trump. Some of it may have been from Russia, but they invested a substantial amount in his election. They do make contributions that are significant. But I think more powerful than the dollars is how intensely they care about this issue and how it, 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 that single focus and that commitment, they're going to be there. And elected officials know they're going to be there on this issue next year. No matter what you do on anything else, they care about this issue. And they're not going to give up as long as this issue is on the agenda and they're hearing all the mythology of people coming in to take away their guns and the government. Unless we care as much about gun safety as they do about stopping everything and raising that issue with elected officials on a regular basis, uh, we won't be successful. And I thought today was important. Uh, clearly we have a much smaller group than we're marching. Uh, and we'll have some other events I know that are coming up on the 20th and thereafter. It has to be a sustained effort. This will not be one rally or one march or one town hall. It requires being just as committed to getting this done 
and ultimately, I think the only thing that will bring about the change that we need is to change the Congress itself. That those members who just want to be showed up. Uh, and that's been a problem uh, all the last couple of years. I did an event at this church last year, a town hall on health care. And uh, so many of the other representatives, they had to put up a cardboard cutout uh, to show them. But we've got to have involvement in the election process to change this Congress. The first campaign I ever got involved with was when I was in ninth grade and I couldn't vote. Uh, but I could put up signs and, and volunteer my time, and I kind of got interested in it from having done that. And whether you're 18 and have a vote, and we need every 18-year-old in high schools, it's actually a state law that uh, principals and, and high schools are supposed to be registering all of these young people, but whether you're 18 or you're not 18, you can still participate and ensure your family and your neighbors are participating, and you can do things with the uh, campaigns, uh, the kind of campaign that, uh, that Claire has here and, and that others that are here and be involved in what they're doing. It's not just the Congress, though that's my focus, but it's also our state legislature and the voice that our city officials can raise as well. Long answer, but I uh, hope that helps. Thank you very much. And your second question will be, um, of all the specific policy uh, agendas and the pieces of legislation that can be passed on gun reform, which ones are the most likely to pass? Well, uh, I, I, that answer, uh, which was none of the above, is probably the most accurate. I, I think maybe I'll use this question to mention one other issue. I think one of the most important is the background check. There are some members who want to do something about gun safety that are not comfortable with the assault weapons ban. I think it's important to do it, but I respect them. The, the gun background check, having a comprehensive background check system so that we're assuring that somebody who's been involved in domestic abuse, in animal abuse, who had problems uh, in the past, to ensure they are not getting access to a gun uh, is, I think, the most important reform that we need to make, one of many but uh, most important. What this Congress just did, not on a freestanding vote, but mixed into the federal budget, is pass something that I've heard much bragging about around here, including down in Sutherland Springs, called Fix NICS. NICS being the national uh, uh, system through which back, background checks are done under existing law. Well, the only problem with Fix NICS legislation is it didn't fix NICS, it barely nicked the problem. Uh, it said, if you remember with Sutherland Springs, there was someone who should have never had a gun from Academy, uh, and the Air Force didn't do its job in reporting what had happened, and neither of some of our other branches. That's terrible. Well, they had that responsibility already, and all this bill does is to tell them to do what they were already responsible for doing, and to do it right this time. And I'm, I don't object to that. A strong letter would have accomplished just about as much. The only penalty it provides is that if you're a political appointee at an agency, say like Secretary of the Air Force, you would be denied your bonus if uh, the, the agency uh, didn't comply. But of course, bonuses for political appointees have been banned since about 2010, so it's no penalty at all. And then there was a provision that the states knew need to do a better job of complying, which they do, but instead of providing the funds for them to do that or putting some penalty if they didn't do their job, it provided uh, that there was some kind of elusive additional priority they might have for getting the limited federal funds we have for, for background checks. So really, it's a sop. It gives the appearance that you care about gun safety without uh, really uh, doing much about it. I guess uh, it, being here in the church, I uh, had a colleague who used to talk about uh, members of Congress taking holy pictures. And what he was talking about is, you know, being there for the ribbon cutting after having voted against the project that you were cutting the ribbon for, things like that. Well, that's kind of what has happened here with this fix next. It does not fix anything, but it creates the impression of caring. Uh, 
Uh, I believe the people that oppose us in Congress over these issues care. They just don't care enough to uh, tell the NRA we can't be with you on this. Thank you. There are a handful of Republicans who do support this. I'm not sure that whether any of them are from Texas, uh, but uh, and, and many of those who are supporting action are retiring uh, rather than, than facing the voters again. Uh, I think that uh, we need to spread this message uh, through our churches, through our community organizations, through our neighborhood associations, through our PTAs and schools, that this doesn't have anything to do with party. It has to do with protection uh, of, our, of our communities. Uh, it's unfortunately taken on a pretty partisan tinge because the Congress does seem to be pretty much owned lock, stock, and barrel by the NRA. And that's the majority that is Republican right now. But I think it'd be great to have uh, more local Republican elected officials, even if they don't have the vote in the Congress or in the legislature, speak out about this and I think going to their town hall meetings on other subjects and the like and asking them why they're not speaking out on this and what they're doing about school safety uh, would be a constructive thing to do. I would welcome bipartisan support. I think it's really necessary to get and you know with our impulsive president one day he was saying all the right things about and maybe kind of going a little too far overboard uh, in some of the things he was going to do about gun safety and then he met with the NRA and he totally changed his position so we've lost that support. But I think if we have a new Congress last year, next year, we had the same old thing last year, but next year if we have a new Congress, I think we might be able to pass legislation and affix it to the budget or some other must-pass bill so that he would not be able to veto it and carry us forward on something as simple as background checks. So on the subject of background checks, um, what do you plan, what plans do you have to address the background check system with regard to mental health issues and why do you think that even though um, people on both sides support this, why isn't it taking well, I pretty much address the why it's not taking place because of our inability to get it on the floor. And we do always think about mental health in these situations. It's important to note that most of the people who have a serious mental health problem pose a danger only to themselves. Uh, just because there's a mental health problem doesn't mean that someone is out committing acts of violence. And I know there's a lot of concern about the, in the mental health community about that issue. Uh, we do need to develop more resources to mental health, and I'm very much in favor of that. It's not an alternative to doing something directly about gun violence, but it is an important thing we need to do on this community. We're not far from Haven for Hope. We know that's, that mental health issues and substance abuse problems are not the only reason, uh, of the many reasons that uh, contribute to homelessness, but it is a factor for a number of the people that are out there, we need to be responding to those concerns as San Antonio has attempted to respond through Haven for Hope. Uh, I, I think there is a chance of some modest progress in the mental health area with funding in Congress. I don't know if we can get that through, uh, but the basic need is involvement through the rest of this year to raise this issue every time there's a public forum even if it's not principally on this subject, to remind people and get people involved in So now we're going to open the floor to anybody who has questions. We're probably going to take 10 to 12, so if you could come line up in the middle, then we can do... Yeah, all right. Then we can do one by one. I'll try to do shorter. Yeah, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah please. Sure, please do. I am here to advocate for gun safety. 
on behalf of my family and friends. You want to, uh, if you don't mind, state your name and maybe what neighborhood oh, you're from? Yeah. Um, I live on the northeast side of San Antonio. Uh, my name is Lauren Davis. I'm here to advocate for gun safety on behalf of my family and friends. My uncle was shot and killed last year. Already, too many people know firsthand what my family and I are going through. No one else should have to know what it feels like to lose their family or to fear for their lives. As my representative, I implore you to fight for the following. Funding the CDC to research gun violence as a public health issue. To institute universal background checks. To ban high capacity magazines and bump stocks. To ban assault weapons. To allow the ATF to uh, digital digitize records for gun sales and require gun dealers to conduct annual inventory checks. There's a common phrase that says a bad guy with a gun can only be stopped by a good guy with a gun. I say let's stop arming bad guys. Thank you for listening and thank you for everyone that put on this town hall. Thank you very much for sharing your story. And uh, I think the best way for me to express my sympathy is to try to get every one of those measures adopted. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I just want to thank you, first of all, for uh, fighting the good fight for such a long time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll keep my question sort of short. Yes, and though I know you, will you identify yourself with oh, yes. your neighborhood? Uh, my name is Jack Lee. I live in Cedar Park and I'm a student at Johnson High School. Great. Uh, how confident are you that at the midterm, Congress will change for that area? Well, I'm pretty confident about it. Uh, I think there are enough people that care, and we're talking today about gun safety, but many of the young people I talk to at high schools and colleges are very concerned about gun neutrality and the interference this administration could do uh, with all of our social media and the net. Uh, they're concerned about discrimination. They're concerned about mistreatment of our dreamers and health care. And I think if enough of those people care enough and don't just protest, don't just put up another tweet uh, or Facebook posting uh, and participate, we can really turn this around. Uh, we have some great opportunities right here in Bear County. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is just a question of whether people care enough and are involved enough and start getting involved long before November to bring about that change. But it can happen, and it will be a dramatic change uh, to get a Congress that is not there to ignore and empower the President, but there to challenge him on his insults to our country. Hi, I'm Steve Hickson, and I live off 281 uh, here at Hollywood Park. And first of all, thank you for everything you've done here to do. Uh, I also want to point out, this thing has been going on an awfully long time. In fact, you and I were in on what you might say is the start of it, which was in the summer of 1966 at UT when Charles Whitman was on the tower and did a mass slaughter of innocent people, and he had mental issues and he got access to this gun. So this is nothing new. It's been going on a damn long time. So uh, please do what you can do something. Thank you very much. Congressman, thanks for being here. Thank you. My name is Anne Marie Schrader. I live uh, in the, uh, near the quarry in the Lincoln Heights area in San Antonio. Um, just a quick question about red flag laws. Yes, um, I haven't talked about that. I'm glad you're raising Yes. What do you think about, if you could speak to those, then do you see any uh, potential roadblocks related to privacy issues that might sort of hinder passage of red flag laws? 
Well, there are there are real challenges in when you're going to act under a red flag law. I do think there is the potential. There's the need to have that kind of legislation in the past. It could be done. It has been done at the state level. Uh, that's probably where the focus needs to be. You want to just elaborate on, on it yourself? So my understanding of red flag laws is that um, someone who is uh, who, who has the potential in the judgment of close family, friends, uh, yep. colleagues, teachers, etc., um, can actually bring those concerns to a judge and yes, have an someone order. investigate the issue and get, a, get an order uh, to take a firearm away from someone who is that threat. And That's my understanding. Not unlike uh, the issues that arise with an involuntary commitment on mental health issues, there are challenges there. Uh, to doing that, but when you have someone with a history of abuse uh, and someone who is engaged in very erratic behavior, the family acting, the neighbors reporting, is probably the best way to prevent a violent situation from happening, and that person would be represented in any kind of court proceeding and, and have an opportunity to make their case, but perhaps using the red flag law we can prevent uh, harm to many people. Thank you for raising it. Uh, my name is Eric Pian. And I'm actually from Texas. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. And I'm familiar with shotguns and hand rifles. I see no reason for assault rifles. They're nothing but killing machines. And can we remain politically involved in this until assault rifles are banned. Thank you very much. And I'm super Hi, my name is Wyatt. I'm actually from Dallas, Texas. Uh, it's good to have you here. Support for us. Um, I have a two for question. I hope that's okay. Sure. Um, so you mentioned uh, that your favorite ban on assault uh, weapons, um, but most murders in the U.S. are committed using handguns. Um, so do you? have a separate plan to address handgun violence, which occurs daily? Well, I think the universal background checks uh, measure is the most important. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a focus on Saturday night specials, uh, and uh, I, I believe automatic weapons pose a challenge. Some of those are pistols, uh, but my focus would be on the issues that would appear to have the most impact on the largest number of people right now universal background checks and military style assault weapons because they can just do so much more damage. Um, and my second question is, do you think the prohibition against computerizing the National Gun Registry should be reversed, meaning allowing a law enforcement agencies to efficiently track uh, criminal gun activity? I certainly do. We need, that's, I refer to that fixed mix, which did so little, but we really need a background system where all of these various states in the national system all linked effectively. Uh, you, you will remember in the horrible shooting in the church in Charleston, one of the issues was getting the data back uh, on t in a timely basis. Uh, the best way to protect the legitimate gun owner who's trying to make a purchase is for there to be uh, a system that works near instantaneously. But if you don't invest in it, you don't link everything together, you don't have everyone reporting. You don't have such a system as your question suggests. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Abigail, and I'm a member of the March for Alliance Dallas chapter. Thank you. Um, okay, so my question is, following the Sandy Hook shooting that killed 20 children and six adults, Connecticut was successful in implementing gun control laws such as a ban on high-capacity magazines and banning more than 150 gun calls. Do you believe that in order to get the ball rolling on common sense gun reform, it would be more effective to begin on a state level rather than national level? Well, I think it, there is action on state level in some states. As you know, after this tragedy in Parkland, Florida overcame its tradition of uh, uh, supporting the NRA on everything and passed legislation. I guess I would have to say, I think acting on the state level is a good idea, but maybe not so realistic here in Texas because there's been so much opposition. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep raising the issue, uh, but I believe in order to get the protection
protection we need here in Texas, it will take federal legislative action. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gabrielle Medina. I live in uh, the Summer Ranch area. Uh, I go to Brandeis High School. I'm a junior. Um, th first of all, thank you for everything you've done. I appreciate you being here. Um, on Saturday, March 24th, not only did I march to end gun violence, but several hours later, experienced it at work. When I heard gunshots and saw people running, a flood of people running, my heart sank. Not only was I in fear for my life, but for the families who had come to enjoy their night and not even have the thought of having gunshots on the premises near their children. My question to you, sir, is even though these major massacres have not happened exactly here in San Antonio, what exactly are you doing to prevent it, specifically in schools? Well, I continue being very active on the gun violence, gun safety effort in Congress. We have a committee that seeks to focus on this issue, look for any opportunity to bring legislation up. I'm doing a similar uh, gathering to this one tomorrow at a high school in Austin, trying to involve and engage as many people as possible and to listen to students like you about their concerns and hear their stories. Because, you know, it's it, it could be next week in San Antonio or the month after that in Dallas or Austin. Uh, that's why it's so important we act now, but our hands are largely tied in Congress until we get some reinforcements and some change there. And that's why I'm encouraging students like yourself who are not yet able to vote to be involved in helping us get the votes to turn things around. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, I'm Alexander Castillo and I go to Southside. I attend Great. Southside High School. And um, I didn't prepare a speech or anything, and went um, basically straight off of um, my passion for this. And it hurts to see that so many students here and um, the variety of ages, age group, and difference um, is very, it, 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 it touched me on an emotional level because. It shows that people from all ages feel the same way. And it's not just the youth, it's not just people that have experienced this. But um, I do want to start off um, saying thank you for um, doing what you do. Because at, at times I know it feels as if everybody's going against you, but you're still out here doing your part and fighting for our lives. As, as times it feels like the government isn't really, um, doesn't really, it's like they're putting the NRA over. Um, our lives, and you're the one showing that's not true, that's not how it is. But um, as the recent um, partner shooting, um, I believe the, the shooter was Nicholas Cruz, um, like, I do want to propose a solution. I know you stated this, and um, something I like to, like a phrase that I like to say is, this is not, like, this is not a war zone. We don't need, um, assault rifles that shoot um, uh, a lot of uh, many bullets in a matter of a minute and with high capacity magazines. Um, if they limit the amount of uh, the capacity to the capacity of these magazines, it, it can lower down the, the amount of people that they're able to take lives from in a matter of the moments of the shooting cone occurring. And if they just minimize it or restrict it down to like maybe five bullets, or it would it would lower the amount of kills. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. I think is useful is to state uh, 
groups like Dick Sporting Goods, which decided to stop selling these kind of guns. right here in our community, selling them. Uh, we, it's a question worth going to ask. It's a question worth uh, affecting your shopping patterns to go to say, I'm not shopping where uh, someone is selling the salt weapon. Little things that might be done that could be big and sending a message that conduct has to change. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Jeremy Gonzalez, and I'm a junior at Salsa High School. Uh, thank you for being here. The question is, until stricter gun laws can be passed, what do you think can be done to improve how students feel about their safety at school? Well, uh, I would think first it is important that every school district have adequate security. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, an effective security officer can really help. I don't think, and we haven't talked about this yet, that the solution is arming teachers. than not having guns there because of all the things that can happen in a classroom and, act and, and, and in errors, mistakes, and problems that develop. Uh, so I think relying on school security is important. Uh, I think each student being ready to report someone who's engaging in bizarre activity that could pose a problem and bring that to the attention of the school authorities is important. And then I return to the thing I've been saying from the start, finding some way to be involved to change our laws and that the lawmakers won't change the laws and change the lawmakers. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elia. Hi, Nueva. And which school are you? I'm from, I'm from business groups. Okay, good. I would like to comment. I was very pleased that me and you have very similar ideas and thoughts about the way we should handle gun regulation. My question to you is, how do you think I should get my other classmates engaged in this, com in this topic? Well, uh, I think in your, some of my first involvement, I used to be, like everybody else, very scared of getting up and making speeches and statements and everything. And I got involved beginning in middle school and then in high school doing debate. Why don't you consider in one of your classes organizing a debate about some of these issues? I learned a lot from debating things that I didn't agree with to understand kind of what's the perspective of the other side. Uh, I think that using, you have might be a part of a club of some kind after school or an organization. Uh, get them to pass a resolution asking the local school board to take a position about gun violence. And then, I know I may sound like a broken record on this, but talk to your classmates about how they might be involved to change the election process. Most of them are probably not at all concerned about who gets elected, state representative or state senator or member of Congress. But that's where these decisions about gun safety are being made or are not being made. And there are also where decisions about dreamers, about schools, about student financial assistance and the like are being made that are so important. So trying to get them engaged on that level. Thank you a lot. For your time. Okay. Yeah, he's just saying we're we're kind of past the time, but I'll, I'll give shorter answers. But I want everyone to be heard, and I want to make one. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, my name is Kathleen. Uh, I'm from Business Careers, uh, the uh -huh. of Business Careers, the video on the school. And uh, uh, it's more of a statement and there might be a questions. Sure. Because, um, but uh, back to the, the mental health issues, I think that the, the people kind of disclaim like, uh, the whole issue on the lens, but like, it's also kind of on the it, it, it's not the gun's fault because the person is the one that pulls the trigger, not the gun itself. So this is what I get caught. And so, what should we be able to do about it? Because, well, 
many problems that have been happening with people who are employed and then sometimes like the uh, no one's there to support them and, and people just have a hard time. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, and you know, and we haven't focused on this. It's good you're raising it, but overall, we need to create a culture of nonviolence for resolving disputes, dealing with bullying. So, discussion groups in school about how you deal with anger, how you deal with violence, how you resolve disputes. Uh, these are really important, uh, and and, and uh, I, I'm hoping that those kind of issues are coming up in schools being raised to try to deal with this. The, you know, it, it is true that someone with a knife, someone sometimes with their bare hands, excuse me, with their bare hands, a little water. Uh, I lost a, a neighbor to uh, someone who used a car as a weapon. All these kind of things can be used as weapons and cause harm. It's just that with an assault rifle, you can do a lot more harm a lot quicker. And that's why we're focusing on Under federal law, uh, private party sellers are not required to perform background checks on buyers, whether at a gun show or other venue. They are also not required to record sale or ask for identification. What's your position on this? Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is the last part of your question. I said, well, basically, under federal law, private party sellers are not required to perform background checks on buyers, whether at a gun show or venue. They are also not required to report sale or ask for identification. What is your position on this issue? And I think that we need universal background checks where all those things, whether they're over the internet or a gun show or individual, you have to provide identification and run it through a background check system. Thank you. My name is Carlos Antonio Raymond, and we march at the Martin Luther King Parade. That's right. And it's a great event. MLK March is a wonderful event. And thank you for your leadership.